many of us can admit that we have a struggle in our lives. How many of us are honest enough to say that I'm tired? I need help, Lord. How many of us are willing to just stand for a second and thank God for going beyond your struggle? Amen. Thank God. Come on, thank God that it's over. It's over. Thank God that it's over, Eddie. The struggle. Thank God it's over. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. It's over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, God. One more time, just for the name of Jesus, let's give God some praise. That the struggle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Most holy and everlasting God, we love you. Thank you, God, for leading and guiding us through the struggles of life. Thank you for being our Father and for being available 24 hours a day. We thank you, God, that we don't have to live in darkness and pain all of our lives, that there's liberation in you, and there's liberation in the name of Jesus, and there's comfort in the Holy Spirit. So we bless your people now, dear, world, dear God, and pray that your word will go forward. We bind any demons that might think about going against us in the name of Jesus. And we declare that this will be worship that magnifies you. We declare, dear God, that we will be focused on you and that we will give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. And Lord, right now, I ask that you would regulate our minds and that you will take control of us spiritually so that we will be caught up in the word and we will give you honor and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In Exodus chapter 33, Verse, this is 19, 20. The Lord said to Moses, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. In verse number 21, then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. Lord, have mercy. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. A covering, oh my God. I'm going to read that again. There's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand. You will see my back and my face. You will see my sin. The sermon titled Moving Beyond the Scars and Struggles of Life. I have discovered that most of us are not strong enough to advance beyond our scars and our struggles. I find that many of us who say that we are believers, that we believe in Almighty God, we continue to live with struggles and scars from the past. What is a scar? It's a growth of tissue marking the spot where skin is healed after my injury. I remember living on Hogan Street in Mobile, Alabama, and my mother was going to get her hair done. She said to us, do not go outside the house. Do you hear me? Yes, ma'am. She said, I'm going to say it again, do not go outside the house. 
Revlon or you know who I put on top of it is still there. So I'm saying that to share with you that yes, we have scars, but you don't have to be limited by those scars. You don't have to live as if the scar is damaging you right now. And after my daddy beat me with my own switch, I never went outside again to play ball. There are four types of scars, normal, fine line scars, keloid scars. Research says that many African Americans have keloids. We overheal. I have keloids. If I have surgery or you scratch me, it's going to be a little spot that you can see. Hypertrophic scars, pitted or sunken scars. So what I'm saying to you, uh, search yourself and find out what is your scar. Because there are also emotional scars, and many of us are stuck in the past. We're stuck with the people who do not love us. We're stuck with the people who reject us. We have emotional scars. We can't let anybody love us and enter our lives because we're so focused on what happened 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And what I'm here today to tell you is that if you want to move beyond the scars, that God is available. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we struggle against the natural rhythms of life, we create resistance and opposition. And this is what leads to struggle. The struggle, there is no joy and rarely any reward. In fact, for some people, struggle is the reward. They are a little lost without it. There is comfort in their reward. Struggles is simply a part of life. Anybody in here got a struggle? Anybody in here have a little problem? Anybody in here got something going on that nobody can fix but God? Anybody here tired of waiting on a change? Anybody here tired of people getting on your nerves? Anybody here tired of being the only one who shows up? Anyone here tired of being the one who does all the heavy lifting but other people have a lot to say? Is anyone here just fed up with people who don't do what they say they're going to do? At the end of the day, struggles are inevitable. There's nothing you can do to stop this. We're all going to struggle in life or feel lost at times whether you like it or not. However, struggle is always makes the reward such a satisfying thing. If you want to struggle, become a pastor for a couple of days. If you want to struggle, try to lead people in the presence of the Lord. If you want to struggle, you need to just step up and step out because you cannot do God's work without struggle. And it's every day and it's all day. Deacon Jay and I had the privilege, the blessing of having a wonderful, wonderful, He put some of our pictures on Facebook, which I didn't know about. So somebody texted me, and they said, you look so happy. And I said, what do you mean, Sandra? And they said, well, I saw this picture of you and Deacon Jay on a catamaran, and I just thought I would call you to let you know. And I had said to him, I don't want my pictures on Facebook. But I love you anyway, Jay. And if don't do that again. Please don't do that again. Please don't do that again. While I was away, I read Finding Me, written by Viola Davis. Mm. Finding Me is a story of a woman who had always fought for me. As we were on the train from Barcelona to Paris because our flight was canceled, I got to read this book. And Viola Davis has always been a great actress. She 
already a constant, only intensified, and the many classes in the boys at her school knew that all of them were white, and she was black, and chested her like dogs hunting prey. And of that bullying, Davis writes, this was four pieces of trauma I was experiencing. My clothes, my hair, my hunger, to my home life being the big daddy of them all. that I had to use these weapons to survive. Anybody in here have to use some weapons to, I'm not talking about a gun or a knife. Sometimes you got to use it. You got to use your spirit. You got to use your knowledge of God. You got to use your stamina. You got to use knowing who you are and not in Christ Jesus. You got to know that regardless of how people look at you, whether you're black, white, red, or green, you're still a child of God. You got to walk in the authority that God has given you and what Davis is sharing with us is that she grew up in poverty. And she said, I, we were not poor. We were poor. We were poor. Poor means the rats live in the house with you. Poor means that the bathroom doesn't work. Poor means that you're sleeping on the floor. Poor means that she had nothing at all. And they were sometimes from the grocery store on the corner to have food. As I kept ready, reading this book, Judge Julie, I thought of some questions I'd like to ask my church. Are you running from bad memories? Are you willing to face your demons? Have you learned to navigate life? Are you a dreamer? Can you see beyond the present circumstances? Who encourages you? Are you willing to take a stand for what you want? What do you want to be? In other words, these challenging questions are getting us to a place of looking at ourselves from a different perspective. Are you living in an emotional war zone? Who challenges you beyond your comfort zone? I said amen to that because I'm so guilty of challenging people to move beyond where they are. The two-one punch, blackness and poverty, she said, is one of the worst things that can happen to you. Because we live in a society where our color still controls to some degree how we are treated. Do you have internal weaponry? You might not have a pistol, but do you have a prayer line? Do you have a gun from God that will shoot the scriptures out and make the demons fly from your front door? Do you know God well enough to call on God to say, I need you to battle for me. I need you to fight this battle. I'm tired of fighting the same old battle, Lord, with the same old people. Are your dreams bigger than your fears? How do you define beauty? Are you defining beauty by the texture of your hair? Are you defining beauty by the size of your nose? Are you defining beauty by the way your hips look when you wear your jeans? Are you defining beauty by a worldly standard? Are you realizing that we're all beautiful because we were created by God? But we live in a society that defines beauty as skinny and pretty and everything's in place. And I know some people who are messed up who are truly beautiful to me. And I realize that life happens. And Barbara, when life happens, you are not always beautiful. Sometimes you got to cry your way through. Have you noticed how ugly people can be when they cry? It's not a pretty scene always. So what I'm saying is that we got to get real on where we are and stop pretending that life is not happening. One of the things that I love about Reverend Leslie is that she not only shares with you her struggles, but she also shares with you the power line to heaven. And she always tells you that God is in charge. And regardless of what struggles I have in this old body, at the right time, God is going to show up. Are you willing to open your mouth and tell your own story? Stop pretending that you grew up rich. Stop pretending that you had everything. Stop pretending that you didn't wear. I don't know about you, but I had shoes with no soles. So I had to put cardboard in those shoes because it was cold during the winter. Stop pretending that you had a room to yourself and you had a private bath. Stop pretending that you had China in the house and that you were eating from the grocery store, you know, fine, 
pretending that you did not grow up on cheese from the government that came in that brown box. Stop pretending that your clothes did not come from the people you work with. My, my mama worked for the um, for the Mostellas, and they gave us clothes. And whatever Malik they put in the bag, that's what we had to wear. So I had clothes that were not only hand-me-downs, they never belonged to me, and they didn't fit at all. But I had to go to school anyway and be as cute as I could with what I had. So what I'm saying here is that finding me helps us to find ourselves. Know your own stuff. What's your attitude? What you mad about? Look at you. Some of you can't even smile. You're just mad about something that happened yesterday. You mad about something that didn't happen today. You mad about something because you didn't show up. So what I'm saying, you need to shake it off in the name of Jesus. And you need to find yourself. Stop being ugly. Stop being emotional and start living like God is truly real. And that's what the Bible is saying is that if you can move beyond, say that, move beyond the scars and the struggles of life, God will prevail. God will prevail. You see, the power in life is knowing who we are and our purpose we serve in passion and power. And too many of us report to duty and we are not spiritually qualified because that's not what God called us to do. If you're struggling and you have an attitude going into the meeting, you probably shouldn't be in that meeting. If you're struggling and have an attitude that you can't carry out your task with joy. You see, when God gives you assignment, this is what Moses teaches us, is that Moses was so human that even though he was insecure, God kept telling him that you can do what I want you to do. Remember, he said, I, I, I can't speak. I'm not going over there to talk to the Israelites because I don't speak. I stutter. God said, I am the man who can fix your stuttering. You just go and do what I tell you to do. What's your best excuse? Come on, tell the truth. What's your best excuse for doing nothing? What's your best excuse for not showing up? What Moses shows us here is that it's okay to ask God questions. But you've got to have a relationship. You have a relationship through study of the word. You have a relationship with God through conversation. You have a relationship with God because you take the time to have an encounter with God. And God is saying, I am not on your watch. You are mine. If you want an encounter with me, it will be on my terms. And some of us are mad at God because God doesn't want to be on our calendar. Life is incomplete without an encounter with God. And in the Bible, when God appears to someone, it's known as a theophany or divine appearance. How many of you have ever experienced the appearance of God? Don't lie and I tell the truth. The experience, the appearance. Come on now, how many? There's four people. How do you know? know because the spirit lights up your soul. You know because the heavy burden is no longer heavy. You know because a voice speaks and says, I got you. You know because it doesn't matter anymore. You say, I'm giving this to God. And today when we focus on an encounter Moses had with God in Exodus 33, we all know the famous story of Moses and the burning bush. I was going to try to tell you everything about this story, but it was only 55 pages, and I decided you wouldn't let me do that. So I decided I'll probably have to come, you can keep with a part two, because I got so much to say about Moses. You see, Moses was a man who was willing to speak up to say, God, I don't know, I have a few questions. And I want to know what's going on. In verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Does God know you by name? The lead sings, he knows my name. How do you know God knows your name? Do you know God's name? We know God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and sent him to lead the people of Israel out of captivity. Moses moaned and groaned about that. I got any mourners and groaners in the house that you moan and groan while you're doing it. You might as well not do it because.
when you moan and groan, you are not lifting up the name of Jesus. And Moses was understandably a little hesitant, given both his limited qualifications and the intensity of the task. But eventually he went and did what God called him to do. How many of us right now have heard from God, but we have not been obedient to do what God don't told us to do? I'm not going to call you out. I know some of you, but I know I know what God has said to me. And I know I get clear information and instruction from God. After dealing with that disaster, Moses is back on the mountain talking with God. In other words, Moses was struggling with life. I'm in good company. Lord, I'm struggling with this. What you want me to do now? What you want me to do, God, about post-COVID? What you want me to do about social media? What you want me to do about a marketing strategy for the church? What you want me to do, God, to get your people excited about you again? What I'm going to do is to move the people from a virtual world that has no salvation to a world where we come together in power, spirit, and strength and praise the name of the Lord. I repented this morning. I was getting dressed for church, and I was praying for a word. And I said, Lord, I'm praying that you will give us the gift of evangelism and that you will give us a testimony that will shake people up and give them a desire to be in relationship with you. And God said to me just this morning, he said, you are not going to be able to take care of this assignment. Instagram, to Facebook, to YouTube, to podcasts, because there's a dimension of life that you can't get through technology. You only get through with me in the midst. And so what God was saying to me is don't believe because you get these numbers up that people are hearing about me. So I'm challenging the church right now. We got to say to people, it's good to be at home in your pajamas having coffee or whatever you do in your pajamas, but it's a better thing, and you get the benefit of feeling and seeing the glory of God when you come to the sanctuary of God. And the Lord said to me, stop pretending that you agree with that. I'm struggling with that, so I'm confessing my struggle that people can walk away from the presence of Almighty God. In this passage we just read, Moses says to God,
hear I gained the freedom that I needed to speak truth about where I came from. I gained, I, I was able to speak truth about wetting the bed and pushing my sister over in it. I can speak truth that we used to do things but just not right. I, sometimes you just got to speak the truth and say, you know what? I'm guilty of that. If you are a liar, admit you are a liar and say that I don't always tell the truth. If you're pessimistic about life, be honest and say, I have trouble with joy. I have trouble with you, Pastor, because you're a good one. you do? I got trouble with you because church going to last too long. I got trouble with you because the praise team sang three extra verses of that song. I got trouble with you because your spirit showed up and it throws off my schedule because the football game is coming this afternoon. I have trouble with you because you want me to give and I've given all I can. I got to pay for my vacation and now you want me to increase my time. I got trouble with you because you never say amen. I got trouble with you because everything's all about you. I got trouble with you that you are negative in a positive, God-fearing environment. I got trouble with you about your attitude about the church. And I got trouble with you because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So I'm saying we ought to give God some praise right now and ask God. Moses, Moses shows us that when God has trouble with us, Brother Royal, God still takes time with us. So. When God, we disappoint God, God still shows up in our midnight hour and does not read to us the church record of what we did and did not do. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. And literally it means something that, I'm going to back up. So after this wonderful assurance of God's relationship and his brave most Grace, Moses asked to see God's glory. I thought to myself, I said, Lord, I sure want to see your glory. We went to Paris, and we went to the top of the Eiffel Tower. And everybody was excited about seeing Paris. I was up there thinking, man, I hope I have a flight like this when I go to see God. I was thinking that I, I can see all of that, but I could just see myself seeing the glory of God. And I said, God, thank you for speaking to my very soul. What is the glory of God? This is a, one of those words you hear quite often, but it is kind of hard to understand. The Hebrew word, kamal, is most often translated as glory, but it also translates in the Bible as honor, splendor, reputation, and or wealth. Okay, so honor, splendor, reputation. What is your reputation? Sometimes you need to ask people, what do you really think of me? Sometimes you need to go yourself and say, I noticed that you walk by, but you don't look happy with me. Is anything going on? So we need to know that we have to work on relationships. And what Moses is doing is showing us that repentance is good for the soul. And it means that it's something heavy or weighty, but usually it is used in a figurative way. An example of this concept might be how someone shares something with you and you respond. For Moses, this was perhaps it's just an extension of his desire to know God's glory. Show me your glory. I want to see you, Lord. Can I get a witness? Anybody willing to ask the God to just show me your glory? I don't want anybody else's glory. I want to see you for myself. Show me your glory, and I want to see you, Lord. Well, how does God respond? God said, I will cause all my goodness whew, to pass in front of you. <laughs> Come on, I'm going to have all of my goodness pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Oh, how powerful that is that the Lord said, I'm going to proclaim my name in your presence, and you will know that it's me. I will do what you ask. How many got a request out right now for God? How many need God to do something on your behalf? How many are waiting for God to answer? Come on, praise God right now. Let me answer. Praise God. But do 
doing what you ask. For God says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. In other words, I will do what you ask. God will grant him a view of his glory. So what God was saying to me this morning as I was getting dressed with you, I'm going to do what you ask. I've done it before. I have a history with Pleasant Grove. I had a history when there were only 12 people on Sunday morning. I have a history of those who didn't show up, but because you were obedient to my word, I blessed you in every, every area of the church. And so the Lord was saying to me, be encouraged because I'm going to stir up some new spirits that are going to be on fire for me. I'm going to stir up some new spirits that are going to take time for an anointing. I'm going to stir up some new spirits that can cast out demons. I'm going to stir up a new spirit that can invite people to come to church and witness God all by yourself. I'm going to stir up some new spirits who know me by name. I'm going to stir up a new spirit so that the people will know me for who I am. And I'm bringing this up again because we all should have a testimony of what God has done, can do, and will do. It's time for us to have a testimony. Yes, we created a script for you. And in the script, we told you what to say, but you ought to be saying that on your own by now because there's only one short paragraph that we want you to say. So we can show God's glory when we give God praise, honor, and glory. And I thought it was interesting that the Lord said, when my glory passes by, <clears throat> I will put you in a cleft in the rock. You can look that up. I'm going to put you in a cleft in the rock. And then I realized that I was already in the cleft in the rock where God has hid. He hid me. I'm in hiding. Are you in hiding because stuff is passing by? Are you in hiding? Because you need help from the Lord. Are you in hiding because you're waiting for God to bless you? There's a cleft in the rock where God can hide you. And it is particularly reserved for those who desire to see the glory of God. There is a cleft with my name on it. And God gave me permission to go in and hide. And though it is not possible to see God face to face, he allows his true servants to see a glimpse. A glimpse, a glimpse, I don't need to see your whole body, I don't need to see your legs and your arms and your head, and I just need to get a glimpse of your glory. I just want to be able to witness that you are Almighty God. Anybody here want to see a glimpse of his glory? Anybody here <coughs> just want to see a glimpse of the Lord passing by? So the Lord said, therefore, you will not see all of me, but for you will hide in the cleft in the rock, and then I will pass by. And the Lord said, right now in Pleasant Grove, I'm passing by. I'm passing by. And everybody who gets a glimpse of my glory will stand up and do my work and tell my people about me. God said, I am passing by. And there's a new generation that's going to rise up and going to do my work. There's a new generation that's going to come that can testify that I am the Almighty God. I am the Lord God. So when Moses prays, he said, show me your glory. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. I don't know about you, but I want to see God's glory. I want to see, I want to see a glimpse of anything I can see. Psalm 18, 2 says, the rock. 
son who came from the father. For John testified concerning him. He cried out, said, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me, he has surpassed me because he was before me. And out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. On this day, yeah, I know there were people in the Old Testament who saw God. I know that Abraham saw God, Sam. I know that Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob. But you know what else I realized? And that was Ezekiel, and there were others. They're just pages of people. When you go to the New Testament, you got Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph, Elizabeth, even the shepherds saw God. And then Simeon, Anna, John the Baptist, Andrew, Peter, the woman at the well, Martha, Mary. What I'm saying to you today is that I want my own special appearance. I want to see God for myself. I don't want to hear about <clears throat> Mary and that baby. I want to be able to testify that I saw God all by myself. And then he took all of my troubles away. He lifted me out of the mortar clay and gave me a refuge in him. I want to see him for myself. I want to know him. I want to know him. And I want to rejoice and praise his holy name all the days of my life. Because we serve an awesome God who loves us in spite of our fallen. We serve an awesome God who forgives us regardless of our sin. We serve an awesome God who provides for us when we have nothing at all. We serve an awesome God who is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. Is he worthy? He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. That's why I praise him in the morning. I praise him in the midday. I praise him at midnight. I praise him in my trouble. I praise him when I'm sad. I praise him when I'm happy. I praise him when I'm lonely. I praise him when I'm broke. I praise him when I'm empty. I praise him when I'm tired. I praise him when I'm down. I praise him when I'm up. I praise him when I'm disappointed. I praise him all the days of my life. I praise him through every struggle. I praise him through every headache. I praise him for every complaint. I praise him because he is worthy. Worthy. I said he's worthy. I said he's worthy. I said he's worthy. I said he is worthy. 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 I praise him on my sick bed. I praise him in the hospital. I praise him all day long because he's worthy, 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 worthy. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Yeah. In my midnight hour, Lord, I praise you. I praise you, Lord. My prayer is that we will all have a glimpse of the Lord. When I go to Alabama tomorrow to see my brother who has dementia, I'm going to praise the Lord. That she'll be 91 years old on Wednesday. And even though she might not know me, Sharon, I'm going to praise God anyway because she gave me birth 71 years ago. I'm going to praise God for all that she has done for me. So I'm trying to say I'm going to praise God when the flight takes off. I'm going to praise God while I sit by her bedside. And if she never calls my name, I'm going to praise God and give him all praise, all honor, and all glory because he's worthy to be praised. So if 
you need help in your struggles, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And the word says that he will direct your path. He will move you through your tears. He will move you through.